Okay, we're going to talk about analytics and search engine optimization, and those things are kind of tied together. We're going to really start with analytics today, and then we're going to go on to SEO, search engine optimization, next week. If you guys are looking for a book on search engine optimization, this is my reference, search engine optimization made simple. It's one that I like to use. There are several other good ones out there, and Google has some good webmaster resources that talk about both analytics and search engine optimization. Analytics tell you about what's going on on your site. So I'm going to show you, now I just enabled Google Analytics on my site yesterday because I forgot to, um, it would help if I turned my overhead projector on first. When I rebuilt my site a few months ago, I forgot to re-enable Google Analytics. So I don't have anything in Google Analytics to show you this week, but we'll look at it next week. I have a, my site isn't that busy, but my YouTube channel is fairly busy. But it will, it, it's interesting to see. There are things that will surprise you about my site. Uh, they, at least they surprised me. I did not realize that I was being viewed a lot in the Ukraine. But there's all sorts of interesting things you can learn about viewers of your site. So the first question I'm going to ask you guys is, how do you know if your site's successful? Maybe. It, you really have to go back to, why did you build the site? When we started the class, we talked about the reasons for having a website. And what were the primary reasons for having a website? Commerce. Commerce, that was one. And we came up with four, I believe. Commerce. To inform. To inform. Knowledge, to entertain, and the other one we came up with was to communicate. So success is determining if you achieved those goals. So sometimes it's page visits. For maryhelp.net, since I'm not trying to sell anything and I'm not trying to make any money off of it, I'll know that I'm pretty successful if I have people visiting my site. For a long time, I think it was just me and my mom. Um, but it, it's getting more popular. and. What, for many sites though, you want what's called a conversion. A conversion is when a visitor turns into a buyer or takes some action that you want them to take. So let's use Amazon.com as an example. A conversion on Amazon is if somebody goes from browsing and shopping to making a purchase. Does that make sense? They take an action. Now on my site, the conversion would pretty much be watching a video. Again, I'm not making money off of it. I don't really care about that. I, I watch what's going on because I think it's interesting. One of the things I learned was that my most viewed page was the one I thought nobody would look at, which was the About Me page. We're going to start by looking at analytics for my YouTube channel because this has been up since 2011, and I have a lot of information about what's going on on my YouTube channel. And I'm showing you these analytics because basically they're the only analytics I have, and I have been watching them for a while. So there are things that are interesting, and Google Analytics shows a lot of the same things. You would be surprised what the web browsers actually know about you. So this is from my, the last 30 days. Um, my biggest YouTube views are in January and September. Any clues why? People use me to help, use my site to help them do their homework. And so people, I get the biggest membership joining in January and September at the start of new semesters. Um, this does not mean that I lost 35 subscribers. It means I got 35 less subscribers than I did this time last month. Again, people tend to join my site at the beginning of semesters. Um, this month, nobody disliked my videos. I've never really gotten why people would dislike my videos, but I do every once in a while. I probably get one person disliking it every two or three months. Um, I get comments frequently, and some of them are meaningful and some of them are odd. I frequently, as in about once a month, get somebody asking me to basically show them how to do their homework for them. And to which I respond, if you send me your broken program, I'll tell you where it's wrong, but I will not show you how to do it. People share mine, which I think is odd, and sometimes people add them as favorites. I find it interesting that this is my most popular video because I never did any follow-up videos to it because we quit using Alice, and I think it's odd that people still watch it because they've changed versions on Alice and this is no longer relevant. But I haven't gone and deleted it and it's still being watched. I have um, my visual logic 
ones are my next most popular, and my, my web design ones aren't actually all that popular, my programming ones are the most popular. Did you know that it can track the gender, theoretically, of who is um, looking at your videos, if that person is logged in under, their, under an actual account? And 64% of the people watching my videos are male. My top areas are the United States, the United Kingdom, India, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Last month, Iceland was in the top, which I also thought was odd. Uh, most people are watching it in YouTube. Some people are watching it on an embedded player on other websites. That would probably be my maryhelp.net site. Um, and mostly I'm getting referrals from YouTube. I'm getting 21% of referrals outside of YouTube. And mobile apps and direct traffic are 17%. I suspect the direct traffic is largely people who are in my classes clicking on a link. I can only make guesses on these. So it'll show me roughly how many views and for which videos they're most popular. Visual Logic and Alice are my most popular topics. It'll show you demographics male, female, and ages, and for the last 30 days, the 35 to 44 year old and the 45 to 54 year old group was the largest. And top viewing locations were the United States, and last month it was Kenya, which always blows my mind when I'm in another country. Playback locations, embedded player on other websites and mostly on the YouTube watch page. And YouTube other I would assume to be an app on a phone or tablet. Traffic sources, YouTube search, external website, YouTube suggested video, unknown direct, again that's probably a link from my class pages, or from my channel page. So that gives you sort of a view of how people are getting to my sites. They'll show you the devices that they're using. 90% are still using a computer. 6% are viewing them from a mobile phone. 3% from a tablet. Somebody's watching it on a TV or a game console. And unknown. You can also see the operating systems. Windows is predominantly the largest. Macintosh, Android, iOS, Linux, other, smart TV. Blackberry, Windows Mobile, PlayStation, and Wii. That's awesome. Somebody's watching my stuff from a Wii. Audience retention. People almost never watch my videos all the way to the end. But they are averaging finishing 39% of a video. Apparently they get what they need and, or find that it's not what they need and they move on. For subscribers, I've lost three, gained 38 for a total gain of 35 subscribers. I have um, 393 videos. I've got 400 and something subscribers total. And so you can sort of watch that. It's, it's interesting to see. Um, likes and dislikes, mostly people feel not too strongly. I've had one person in the last 30 days dislike one of my videos. Several people have made them as favorites. I get about 10 to 15 comments a month. More in January and September. And a few people share them. And so that's pretty much what you can see from the um, analytics side on YouTube, which is pretty good stuff. It's, and I, I follow it. I, um, I think it's interesting, especially what I always find the most interesting is where my videos are being viewed. So when you're reaching out into the world, you don't know. When you toss something out there, when I first put up this site, I assumed incorrectly that my audience would be current and past students. Because frequently, I would frequently being once or twice a month, I would have students who I'd had in the past emailing me saying, hey, Mary, I'm 
really working now or I'm at another school. And do you remember that video you did on whatever? And they'd ask me where to find it. So I just put this up so that anybody who's taken a class from me, you guys would probably remember if you wanted to find any of my videos, you would know to Google Mary Help and go find it, right? I thought that was the limit of my audience. I don't think most of my students are in these other countries. And some of them, I even wonder if there are people there speaking English. I find it interesting other people have republished my videos elsewhere. I didn't think that they were worth republishing, but they are apparently out there. So it's just interesting stuff to watch. So let's compare this to what's on cPanel. And you can look at cPanel on your own site. Go ahead and open a new tab and follow along on this. And so I'm going to open my sample site here. It will be interesting to see if you have other people looking at your sites. I know that I'll have some simply because they have the sample files that I show people on how to do things, and so I point to them. But you have a logging section in cPanel. Is everybody able to find your logging section? Some of the logs may or may not be turned on. They may or may not match mine. You can see your latest visitors. And I am apparently getting a few. Are you guys getting visitors? You should be getting at least two. You should be checking your own site. Plus, we had the whole class checking it from our cell phones at one point. So you should have a few things in there. If you go back, you can look at your bandwidth that you're using. All of my usage is from the website. I'm not using other services like mail. It's important to track that if you're being charged by bandwidth. Page views aren't usually that big on sucking bandwidth. You can look at the Logaholic. And so I'm actually getting a few visitors to my web page. I expect that I will get more since Web Fundamentals just started. Anytime I get into a class that teaches hand coding where I'm pointing people to the page, my views go up. <clears throat> so on Tuesday, 13 people visited my site for a total of 250 page views. And I suspect most of those are probably my students. Oh, look, my website is gaining visitors. You can see visitors per day, visitors per month, and it's showing me April, so there's not a big difference. But if you want to, you can change it for the last 30 days, and you should see something in there then. So I've had 22 visitors in the last 30 days, Again, I would expect that that's predominantly my student, students. Days of the week, since I teach an online class, I expect that to be pretty evenly distributed, and it is. Top country cities, I expect all of the people on this is pretty much the United States. Uh, that's odd. Apparently, I'm getting visitors from Asia. It'll give you visitor details, most active users, and where they're coming from. And I'm not the least bit to see, surprised to see most of them are coming from McHenry.edu. I would expect on this particular page that. Are you guys getting any statistics? You should be having some. Are you guys getting any page views? You can see how long they visit for. And you can see what country they're visiting from. Is anybody else getting somebody other than the United States? Excellent.
and you can see total duration, how long they're here. Most people are on my site less than 10 seconds. And I would expect the ones who are there longer than that are actually taking a class from me and looking at things. Popular content, top pages. And these are almost all pages from my class or I've been visiting myself. Some of this is my viewing the pages and working on them. You can look at the details. top entry pages. That's where they come in from Google or come into the page and it's typically to the home page. Top exit pages. People are mostly leaving from the home page, realizing it's not the site that they're looking for. And you can also get your click paths. Tells you where people are leaving. You can see if you're using an internal site search. You can check your incoming traffic, your top refers. I was very disturbed when I looked at this on the maryhelp.com site and people apparently the last page before they got to mine in a couple of cases was porn sites which I found deeply disturbing. I don't think that goes with programming. Top refers. I'm mostly referring to this site from inside of Canvas top keywords. Now this is important. Keywords are what we're really going to talk about when we get into search engine optimization because you want to rank near the top for whatever keywords are used on your site. If you have keywords with little competition, for example, the keywords I was worried about for maryhelp.net were Mary and help. I didn't think I would have any competition on that combination. But in another country, India, I believe, Mary is like a girl Friday. She's, that means a maid. So looking for Mary help is bringing up searches for people who are looking for maids in India, which I think is interesting. I'm still winning, but I found that interesting. You can get into your top keyword details. And so Mine are basically referring from either Mary Help or mccdgm.net because I do send stuff over from Mary Help. Um, and you can look at the click paths. This is all information that can tell you how well you're doing. Search engines. Mary Help.net is sending people over here, which I would expect because I know I do it on purpose. My Google rankings, I expect them to be very low here because this is my site on mccdgm.net. This is not Mary Help. My most crawled pages. What does it mean by crawled? How often the search engines have sent a robot through to crawl it? Client system. This will tell me what my users are using and I think this is important. I would not have guessed if I were to predict what my people viewing this were using, I did not predict that Internet Explorer 7 would be the number one browser on this site. I would have expected Chrome and Firefox. Safari, Internet Explorer 6, Firefox old versions are being ignored, but you can see I'm using a lot of older technology. Why is that important? Why do I want to know that? so that I'm not using technology that they can't support, largely. And generally, if you're looking at an international audience, what browser should you optimize for? More specifically, I'm going to say browsers that are three years old. You should typically be programming with three-year-old technology. Why? Most of these browsers are three years old or less. 
I don't know how old Internet Explorer 6 is, but most of these are three years old or less. Operating systems. This one, much better here than on the Mary Help site. This is about what I'd expect. Windows Vista, Windows 7, Mac OS, Windows NT, that's old, Windows XP, Mac, Linux, Windows other versions. Screen resolution. Not really telling you. Color palette. Hopefully that we've got the full spectrum here. Nothing really to report there. And then mobile users. We're getting a couple. Android, iPhone, Opera. And you can do all traffic by day, all traffic by month. Did you guys know that any of this stuff was being recorded from your sites as you were working? There's always analytics being captured if you have a good server. Google Analytics will break it down better. I would love to show you that, but I only turned mine on last night at 10 p.m. and since then I've apparently had two visitors. Um, I will show you it in a second. Now here, this is the one for uh, maryhelp.net, just to show you a quick comparison. This one is actually Oh, that one's turned off. So I'm going to look at Webalizer on this one. You guys should have Webalizer as well. I like this one a little bit better. It shows you my summary in nice pretty bar charts and my daily average and my monthly totals. This gets about 272 visits a month, so it's no longer just me and my mom. And let's see, we have days of the month, days of the week. Since it's only showing me April right now, it's not really a great prediction. Hours countries. Apparently maryhelp.net, it doesn't completely match um, my YouTube channel. Apparently people from France, the Ukraine. I, I, I'm always interested when I see these coming from other countries because it surprises me. Um, you can see hosts, where they're coming from, authenticated users, visit duration, and it'll show you which resources are accessing PHP, CSS, HTML. Shows you the operating system. Number one is Windows. Number two is Mac. The top browsers here for this one are Chrome, Firefox, and then Internet Explorer, which is what I would expect. Links from external page. Some of these disturb me. And then you can get into your versions on your operating system. So this surprised me. Windows XP. 17% of my um, visitors are still using Windows XP. I think this is because they do have a large number of people from outside of the country, which takes longer. People are still accessing it from Windows 95. That sort of blows my mind, too. I'm sad for the people who are still on Windows ME. And then you can get into your browser versions. So there are still, well, my site has been visited three times from Microsoft Internet Explorer 5.5, so I should be targeting six and higher. And it's just, this is, this is interesting stuff so that you can see who's accessing them. And you will need to get to the point, if you're going to go into this professionally, where you can read and make decisions based on these analytics. And one of the key things that we're going to get into with SEO is the search key phrases and search words. Apparently the key search phrase that came up for me was recursion in an animated form. I do use all of those keywords 
unintentionally because they're used in Java and they're also used in ActionScript. And then people are looking for things that are not found because I've changed a few things. Okay, so let's talk about Google Analytics. So um, I asked you guys to sign up for Google Analytics. I turned this on at 10 p.m. last night, so I obviously have not had a busy site since then. This has a lot more reporting and customization than what comes on your server. So th this is not a really good demonstration because it's only been collecting it since 10 p.m. last night. And it's sort of being a little buggy because there's nothing going on there. But you can see a little bit of what's going on here. This is pretty much the industry standard. Let's just go into it generically. Okay, so Google, this is talking about turning data insights into action. And this is probably one of the most used analytics tools. And it's also to the point where they're cha they're, you can use it for detecting um, mobile apps. And of course, they do have a paid version. And so you can see what, it, what sort of things it can tell you. I wanted you to create a Google Analytics site, and you should have on there a code next to it. Does everybody have a code next to their site? That's what you're going to need to add it to WordPress. So I have not actually added it to WordPress. I've been playing with it in Drupal, but I want to show you how to do a couple of different, we're going to, the next segment is going to be on adding plugins to WordPress. So this will be the start of a new lecture. So for WordPress plugins, in it, leave your Google Analytics tab up, open up a new tab, and go to your WordPress site. put it in here twice on accident. Uh, one of the things that you may wish to do is add a Facebook like button, which should connect to your page. And you can add a comment. But you should be able to connect to your own Facebook page. How many of you have a professional, not personal, Facebook page? Something else to show you then. OK. Um, in Facebook, how many of you have a personal Facebook page? OK, that would be most of you. You can, interesting, this one's going to my personal page. Uh, that's not what I want. So in Facebook, I was viewing this in a different browser yesterday. You can create a page for a business or place, company or institution, brand or product, artist, band or public figure, entertainment, cause or community. So you can create public Facebook pages that are related to a cause or anything. I have one as a public figure for me as an instructor. Not because I really need one just to show people how to do it. So. It's off in this little drop down arrow on the side here. And so this is my teacher page, which if I get two more people to like me, then I get statistics on how people are using this. I don't really care because I'm not 
doing much here. I need to actually get this tied in. You, there are WordPress utilities that will either post to your Facebook page for you or pull posts from your Facebook page and put them on WordPress for you. Why would that be valuable? So you don't have to do it twice. So you don't have to do it twice, plus um, what's the most best way to get people to come back to your site regularly? Have the content change. If you have a static page that never changes, how often are people going to come look at it? You need to have the ch content change on a meaningful ba in a meaningful way. So this all links to what I'm doing on maryhelp.net. And it's all interconnected. And why would I why else would I want to why would I want to have a professional Facebook page? Free advertising. Plus, it helps me for search engine optimization. Because the more external sites that link to your site, the better that Google thinks your site is. Why would that be? If a lot of external sites are linking to yours, other people obviously think it's valuable. How does Google determine whether or not you're, um, well, let's talk about search engine optimization for a second. Let's go to Google. And give me any topic. What, would we, what do we want to look for on Google today? Coffee. Coffee. Sounds good, obviously. I'm, we need some help keeping everybody awake. And Google knows where I am, obviously. It tells me where the nearest coffee is to me. Then it has Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, telling me about coffee. What is it? We have coffee news, and we have local coffee places. And this is pretty good example of what would come up. Now, if you were a coffee shop in Crystal Lake, what is, what is getting the best search engine results for a coffee place in Crystal Lake? Right, because it should appear on the top three. When you're searching for something, 65% of people will click on one of the first three responses in Google. If you're on page 10, are they going to see you at all? No. And it's based on different keywords. Um, I'd like everybody to try this one. Try typing in buy a computer. Now you'll notice This little I here says it's sponsored. What does that mean? We'll pay for those top three slots. Absolutely. And how do they pay for it? Yeah. Okay, but how do they determine how much to pay for it? How popular the search is. Indirectly. It's called pay per click advertising. And so they bid on keyword phrases how much they're willing to pay. So apparently, and you can tell, add, 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 these are paying for you to click on them. Apple is paying the most. You guys want to cost Apple some money? Click on it. You probably just cost them five, six, fifty, seventy-five cents. I don't know how much they're paying. It depends on the keywords. That's where the price comes in, is on how popular those keywords are. But they pay every time somebody clicks. That is the easiest way to get to the top of a search engine. But organic search is ideally what you want to have work. Now, some areas, if you type in certain keywords, there aren't going to be any paid advertisers. Um, how long do you think it takes from creating a web page for it to be recognized and searched by Google? 
If you put a page up today, how long will it take you to start to rank in Google? And it would depend on the keywords. How does Google know you have a new site? Just to rank or to become popular? It would depend on the keywords. How, for Google to know your site exists at all, how long would it take? How? It's not very popular. How would it know that you have a site? Because it's searched the keywords that we've done. But how would it know that your site exists? Uh, magic. Yeah. <laughs> magic. Okay. And, and but this is this is it's back to the field of dreams things. If you build a site, how many of you have had more than a hundred visitors on your site in the last month? Probably none of you. And I wouldn't expect you to. This is a homework site. Go Google yourself or something. So Google some of the keywords from your site. See if your site comes up. So for me, I'm going to type in um, Mary JavaScript examples. And if, when I put in the keyword Mary, it's going to bump it up. But if I just put in JavaScript examples, I'm not going to come up, I don't think. Too many. If I add my name into that keyword phrase, hmm, that's not me. That's interesting. There's another Mary out there with JavaScript. But I do come up. I'm the next 10. But it still doesn't bring up the one from school. See if you can bring up keywords that will make. There we go. I made mine come up. So Google does know I exist. It's been out here for, um, this site's been out here for since 2011. So for three years. So I would expect that it would know that this particular page would exist. How many of you were able to come up with keywords that made your site show up? So we have one person in the class that made Google find it. So we're going to ask again, how does Google know your site exists? Well, there are two possible ways. You can submit your site to Google and tell it that it exists. That is the first best thing you should do. In fact, you can give it a site map in XML so you can give it all of your pages. And then it will know it exists, and then it takes about 24 hours for it to show up in the search engine. But if you don't tell Google that your site exists, I find it takes about a week, depending on if other sites are linking to it. Because what happens is they send spiders or bots, short for robots, that crawl through the web exploring links. And for me, uh, my keyword phrase that I was trying to win on was Mary help. And I am number one for Mary help. Again, there's not a lot of competition, but you do, but I only take the top two spots. Everything else goes into another language. Um, you get my YouTube channel, you get my website. How long do you think it took me to raise to the number one spot from the key phrase, Mary help, which there is admittedly no competition for? That took me seven days, which isn't bad, but there's no competition for it. Now put in your own name. Now, if you're like me and you have an unusual name, you should come up quickly. I am blessed by my parents that my name is Odd. There aren't a lot of Mary's M-E-R-I out there. And if I used my full name, I wouldn't come up as Meredith. I think if you put in Meredith Winchester, it's a vet in Wisconsin. But these are pretty much mostly me. That can be good or bad, 
but it is something you need to be aware of. Since you guys are trying to get into the web design field, you want to be able to control your results because this is your personal reputation and part of this comes under online reputation management. In online reputation management doesn't mean don't be out there, it means control what's out there. You're not going to run into anything on me that I, I'm not aware of. Okay, so we're going to go back to Facebook for a second here. Um, you can and probably should, with some thought, create a public page because it's a way to advertise for yourself. How many of you have liked a celebrity or personality page on Facebook? I'm a fan of a fictional dog. Has anybody ever read the Iron Druid Chronicles? No, okay. That, I'm a fan of that. And so if you're a fan of things, then you see their updates. So people can like you and become a fan of you. So on my practice here, I have this one that's going to my personal page, which I need to change, and this one goes to my public page, which is correct. And you see the public page, if you were to look for my public page, it's Mary Help. And so this becomes part of your personal um, marketing strategy. Now, if you're trying to get employment, is this going to help you? Maybe. Maybe not. What's the best place for social? And this is, um, we're, we're working on social media marketing as well as search engine optimization. Um, there's actually a whole conference on social media marketing. And you know professionally the most important social network you should be on? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. And there's a whole bunch of directions just on how to be popular on LinkedIn and how to get business on LinkedIn. Let's say that you want to go and be a web designer and get business through LinkedIn. What groups should you join? Well, do you think that other web designers are looking for a new web designer? Actually, it, you should be in some to learn from, but they're not going to get you business. You should get into things that you're actually interested in, whatever it is you actually do outside of web design, because you're more likely to make friends. So if you're in class, into classic cars, you join a group on classic cars, then if one of those people was looking for a web designer, they would see that you're a web designer and they might use your services. If you're in a web design group, you're unlikely to find other people looking for your services. Does it make sense? So for joining groups, you should go in groups of things that you're interested in. It's okay to join web design groups because you'll learn stuff from them, but you won't get business from them. So there's a whole strategy for that too. So this is all part of social media marketing. And the best social media marketing is viral. Do you guys know what I mean by viral? I will see if I can find one of the, I'll give you an example. Um, there, are vi there are ads that go viral I probably shouldn't be doing this particular one because it's beer, but I love them anyway. This is probably one of the most viral commercials this in the last few months. And I don't have sound here, but how many of you have seen this commercial? And how many of you saw it live on TV? And how many of you have seen it on the internet? Three times as many of you have seen this commercial on the internet as they have on TV. So the best way to drive people to your page or to your product is to create something that other people will share. Does that make sense? It's viral marketing. So if you can get other people linking to you or sharing what you're doing, that is better than anything that you can create if you can get people to do their own testimonials. And often it happens by accident. There was an example of, I think it's Procter & Gamble did an Olympics site where they were talking, it was based on the moms of the Olympic participants and people just started talking about how their moms had supported them. So they created a whole site supporting that and people just went to it in droves talking about how much they cared about their moms. And it was just slowly, slightly related to Procter & Gamble, but it got a huge amount of activity and that opened them up for advertising.